Good morning. My name is Kristen Mullen, and I am the Director of Housing Development and Incentives for the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity, or TEO. TEO is the public trust authority that serves as the lead entity for the City of Tulsa in carrying out community and economic development. I want to thank you for joining us today for our presentation on the weatherization program from PSO, as presented by PSO, the City of Tulsa, and TEO. Before we begin today's presentation, I wanna share with you two opportunities for landlords and property managers at the City of Tulsa. The first is the Abode Initiative, which provides information to landlords and property managers about resources and opportunities in the City of Tulsa, such as this webinar. You can receive regular email updates and also reach out to the City and TEO with questions or concerns that you may have. There's no cost to participating, just email me at kmaun at cityoftulsa.org. Second is the Gold Star Landlord Program, a free and voluntary program that provides rewards and incentives for landlords and property managers who engage in the best rental practices. Incentives include advertising and promotion as a Gold Star Landlord and prioritize processing of applications to the City of Tulsa's Emergency Rental Assistance Program. To become a Gold Star Landlord, landlords must agree to participate in free programs, including the Tulsa Health Department Safe and Healthy Homes Program and the Early Settlement Mediation Program. For more information on the Gold Star Landlord Program, please visit www.cityoftulsa.org slash landlords or email goldstar at cityoftulsa.org. Our presenters today are Mary Jackson and Bradley Cockies. Mary Jackson is the Energy Efficiency and Consumer Program Coordinator for PSO, and Bradley is the President of Titan ES. Today they will be presenting on PSO's weatherization program. We have also had presentations this month on PSO's energy efficiency programs for single family and multifamily properties. If you were not able to attend recordings of those webinars, they are, or if you not, were not able to attend, recordings of those webinars are available on the City of Tulsa's YouTube page. There will be an opportunity for questions afterwards, so we ask that everyone keep their, their cameras off and microphones muted during our presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We are also recording today's presentation and it will be made available to share online. Thank you and I will turn it over to our presenters. Hey, good morning, I'm Mary Jackson. I am going to attempt to challenge my technological skills and um, share my screen for a PowerPoint that we have developed for you all today. Let me see how many tries it takes me to get this right. Let's see. Um, well, I may do it, you never know. Fingers crossed. Can you all see my screen? With the yes, first we can. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us today. We're here to talk about PSO's Weatherization Assistance Program. This program has been around um, with PSO. Well, first of all, this program has been around from PSO since we started our energy efficiency program back in 2010. At PSO, we always start any of our meetings with a, a safety briefing. So I provided a small safety topic for us today, uh, step ladder safety. With our weatherization program, we, we do use a lot of step ladders or ladders um, to complete the measures we install in the home. So it's always a good reminder um, of your safety precautions you should put in place. I know from experience, if you get in a hurry, it always leads you to uh, the chance or the opportunity to make a mistake. I was volunteering at a rebuild site several years ago and was using a step ladder and thought I was outside. So I set it up. We were painting the outside of a house. I set it up, crawled up the ladder, but I did not check the ground underneath me when I set it up. The, the surface was dirt and grass and there was actually a crowbar that kind of faded into the dirt that I actually sat my step ladder on. Consequently, when I stepped on that step ladder, thankfully it was only like a little three foot step ladder. Um, I toppled right over. So always make sure you check um, your surroundings before you set up your ladders and make sure you have three points of contact, um, follow the manufacturer's instructions, check for power lines. But just, just make sure you're aware of your surroundings. So that's our, uh, our safety moment for today. 
Our weatherization assistance program provides free home weatherization to qualifying customers. We do things like attic insulation, air and duct sealing. Those are all completely free for those customers. Like I said, this program's been around for a while. These are some of the statistics from last year. PSO weatherized over 2,000 homes across our service territories. Now we cover a, a large portion of Oklahoma. We break ourselves into like three or four districts. So we have like Bartlesville district, Tulsa district, um, what we call our McAllister, our, our Southeast district and Lawton, which is our Southwest district. But I will say of those 2000 homes, a thousand of them were done in our Tulsa metropolitan area. We visited 126 unique communities. We also have collaborations with Oklahoma Natural Gas and Centerpoint Gas, and those allow us to even complete more homes under this weatherization program. They supplement the cost for homes that are served by both entities. Kind of how does this weatherization program work? Well, I'm going to kind of go over the, the basics uh, of the, our weatherization program. Brad's going to step in when we start talking about, you know, the measures that are actually installed on site. But how it works is it's for customers who are either homeowners or renters with household incomes of 50000 or less. Those customers may be eligible to receive the free upgrade. Now, if it is a rental, home situation, we do need property owner approval. So as you'll see here in a minute on in the next slide, there's a form that the landlords, landlords will need to fill out in order to be able to provide these services to that customer. And when we say customer, it is the person who has the PSO electric utility bill in their name. That's who the qualifications are based on. So that would be the person that would need to reach or meet the household income. Titan ES, who Brad is with, is our provider for these services. We've worked with Titan since 2010, so we've weatherized several homes together over the years. Once you pass the original, what we like to call phone screening, and that's where a representative from Titan will talk with the customer, kind of ask them the basic information. Um, do you meet the income requirements? Uh, the homes need to be 2,000 square feet or less and they need to be built before the year 2005. I believe Brad may have to correct me on that one. We've changed that over the years, so I always get a little iffy on that one. So if the home is you know, 2005 or older, so anything that was built before 2005 that's under 2,000 square feet with a house, with the customers having a household income of 50,000 or less would hit our first major criteria component. Those are kind of asked over the phone by the Titan representative. If they don't know the square footage, that's fine. They'll measure when they get out on site. Once we get past that step, Titan will have an assessor go out to the home. Brad will go into more details about that as we go through our slides. Once the assessment's been complete, then a crew is actually scheduled um, for service at that home. Again, if they qualify, all of this is completely free through PSO. It only applies to single family homes, this program. Uh, so anything like a duplex or smaller, we don't do anything bigger than a duplex. We do do mobile homes. We have some measures we can do for mobile homes as well. This is a landlord agreement I kind of referenced earlier. So if we come out and do the assessment, we find out that the home is a rental property. Then we ask the either the, the PSO customer that's inquired about the program to get with their landlord or to give us landlord information so that we can contact the landlord and, and have this signed. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Brad, who's gonna kind of go through what happens um, from the assessment point on um, through Titan. All right, thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, my name is Brad Cockings and uh, president of Titan ES. And like she said, we've been uh, partnered or been the contractor for installing the measures um, since 2010. Uh, we have roughly 35 employees that are um, solely for weatherization. Uh, we have an office, offices in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and uh, that allows us to service uh, the entire, all the regions, uh, all the PSO districts. Um, a lot of staging areas in McAllister, 
um, and all throughout the state um, so we can get to the hard to reach uh, communities as well. Um, so the whole process starts, of course, with the initial uh, phone call, um, whether they call us or it's a list provided to us and we reach out. Um, and um, we have a phone interview process where we have a questionnaire. And we kind of run through the questions as far as household income, square footage, um, things that they know about their house, um, whether it's central heat and air, whether they have roof leaks, uh, you know, kind of the get an idea if there's something, if they're doing remodeling in the home. Of course, we don't want to do weatherization until they complete the remodeling, uh, things of that nature. And, um, and once we get through uh, the, the questionnaire, um, you know, we do, it's a pretty, I say in-depth questionnaire. I mean, it takes, you know, probably, you know, 10 minutes to get through, but the point is there's some reason they're not eligible for the program. You know, we don't want to waste their time um, if their home is a 2007 or if their income's too high, things, things like that. So um, <clears throat> once we get through the phone interview process, we inform the customer to have a copy of their PSO bill um, available for our assessor. And then we schedule them for an assessment um, at a specific time or maybe an hour range. Uh, it depends how kind of busy we are. And when the assessor shows up, um, first thing he or she will do um, we'll ask for that PSO bill. Um, now we can take a picture of it. Um, you know, if they have it pulled up on the computer, take a picture of it. If they have one to give us, fantastic. Um, you know, but we have to, we have to have a recent PSO bill, uh, to verify not only the account number, but the names on the bill. We'll also we'll have them sign an income verification page. Uh, basically it just attests, um, get a test to that they sign that they make under uh, the $50,000 threshold in household income um, and whether they own or rent. And um, you know, so it's based on good faith um, answers. And then um, if, they, if they are a renter, of course we know they're a renter um, before we go, if they usually tell us during the phone interview, um, we'll get that information if we don't, we didn't get it in the uh, in the phone interview process. We'll get that information, so we'll be able to reach out to the landlords and property owners, I should say, and um, you know get that documentation, get get their approval. <clears throat> the assessor will also start uh, looking at health and safety issues. Um, that's you know the main thing. You know, anytime you're going to make a home more airtight, um, if there's some health issue, as far as like carbon monoxide. Um, that's not a problem now because the house is really leaky. We want to, um, we don't want to tighten that house up and uh, you know make a situation like that worse, which we'll get into the carbon monoxide testing here in just a sec. Um, they'll also, as far as, uh, and they'll, they'll measure the home um, when possible at the office. We'll look on county assessment records. Um, sometimes they're a good source, uh, it kind of depends. Sometimes we get out there and there's an addition built on that didn't have a permit pulled, you know, and the house is bigger. So we will measure the house to, to get an accurate uh, square footage reading. Uh, we'll look at the doors, the windows, you know, look around, especially the windows, looking around the edges and see where if there's air loss uh, coming through, look at the condition of the existing caulking, the type of windows. We'll look at the doors, look at the weather stripping see what kind of condition it's in. Um, uh, we usually replace the weather stripping. And we have uh, you know, three or four different options to do that. So it'll kind of, the, the assessors are to build a work order, you know, what, to, you know, what this door needs, make sure that we, that we have it on our trucks and stuff when we show up. Look inside the mechanical closets. Uh, the mechanical closet is usually where your water heater or your air handler is. Um, in there, we're looking for uh, more health and safety issues, fresh air vents, which we'll get into again, um, and looking for an open top into the attic, uh, things like that. We'll look under the sinks, um, any place where plumbing is coming into the house, you know, to note that there's um, penetrations or there's areas around those penetrations that need sealed up, uh, which there usually is. We'll look at the HVAC system. 
um, when we're looking at that, we're, you know, we're trying to find the exact tonnage uh, from the label, if there is one. Um, we're also, but mainly we're looking at the duct situation. Um, from there, the assessor's building a work order again. How many duct joints, how many registers, um, looking at the, you know, looking at the supplies and plenums and, uh, you know, seeing uh, what kind of condition it is and uh, making any special notes, you know, all kinds of things that we find, disconnected ducts, things of that nature. So, um, <clears throat> and then we'll do uh, carbon monoxide testing on all gas appliances. Um, I might go to the next, next slide there. I think it's next. Now the way we do carbon monoxide testing on gas appliances is a little different than, um, it's a little different than like if you call the gas company and they come out or a lot of your heat and air guys, they'll do an ambient reading, which is basically they're just testing just the air in the room um, and getting a reading from there. Um, as the picture kind of shows, we actually get a reading from inside the flue. So you may not have, if you have carbon, if you have a carbon monoxide issue, it may be venting just fine through that flue and going to the outside but it may be really high concentration of carbon monoxide. So, and the fear there, you know, the fear there is if some reason the house changes, whether we change it or it changes in some other regard, uh, that system, that flu could backdraft and cause more carbon monoxide to go into the home. So we test in the flu and um, of all the gas appliances. And there are certain ranges for every gas appliance. Uh, gas combustible appliance that uh, that because they're all going to give off some carbon monoxide most unless they're fairly new but uh, you know want to make sure it's within a, a safe safer range and uh, if there is a situation of course we we address it immediately with the customer and uh, you know and we got to make sure that situation gets fixed before we you know proceed further and that kind of goes along with the fresh air vents, uh, fresh air vents in a mechanical closet. So you have, a, so if you have a water heater, like in a little closet, fresh air vents are vents that come, you usually have one that's, they're both in the ceiling and they come down. One's really short called your high. One comes way down, it's called your low. And what that does is cause a uh, circulation of fresh air. Um, not only if there is a carbon monoxide issue, but also if they're uh, that heat, that water heater or heater needs fresh oxygen to, uh, to burn more efficiently. So fresh air vents are very important. So make sure that uh, if a problem does go wrong, it's going into the attic and also to keep a fresh amount of oxygen for that gas appliance to, to, uh, to burn and burn correctly. So, and then the uh, assessor will look at, so and also look at uh, the attic insulation. Um, we, uh, we try to bring, we bring all the insulation levels up to an R38 and R value is the resistance to heat. So um, an R38 is what's code in Oklahoma. It's higher in some places up north, of course. Um, but whenever the assessor is looking at the attic, um, sometimes it's a little hard to judge. Old insulation, poorly installed insulation. I was trying to get an idea of how level um, you know, if there's spots where there's none, they're also looking at um, storage areas that uh, we won't blow over and adjust our square footage that we're blowing uh, insulation over as uh, far as our final calculations and stuff. Um, when we do install the insulation, uh, we use uh, the uh, blown, blown in uh, loose fill fiberglass and bring it up to 14 inches. Uh, it's probably that's higher if you take the R value of the fiberglass, but when we initially install it, it kind of aerates it. So that 14 is probably gonna settle down to an inch or two over, uh, or about an inch over the next um, you know, year as it kind of compresses a little bit due to humidity and stuff. But, um, and that's what an attic should look like when we get done. It should be nice and smooth and level and uh, not, you know, not full of a lot of peaks and valleys because I mean, you could have 20 inches on one, you know, one side of the attic, 
But if you only have three, that heat is going to go to the place of least resistance. Find that three inches in, you know, going to the house, or the air from the house is going to seek that that uh, weak spot and go into the attic. So, um, in, we install rulers. Uh, that's not only for us to help uh, help us whenever we do blow the insulation. See where we're at. Make sure we're not. Uh, you know, overblowing or underblowing, uh, but also helps um, the customer or anybody that uh, gets in the attic see um, how much the, you know, what the level of the insulation is versus wading back in it, you know, kicking insulation around and putting a, um, a tape, tape measure down. So, um, so, but insulation is a big part of the program. Uh, we blow a tons of insulation. And it's pretty amazing how many homes, um, you know, are really insu insufficient on insulation. Even homes that have bats. Uh, if your bats are not uh, installed correctly, if they're not, you know, level and pushed down, I mean, all it takes is just a little gap. And that R value of that bat insulation, the air just goes right around it. So. Um, moving on. I'd like to add, um, just in there, I'd like to add, when we do the original assessment, we do check to make sure that there's no tongue in, or sorry, I can't even talk, any um, bare wire in the attic. So yeah. therefore that it would qualify for the installation. So that's already predetermined before the crews go out and do the work. Knob and tube wiring. I couldn't even think of what it was called. Yeah. Not um, but yeah, that, that's addressed in the original assessment. So if there's knob and tube wiring present, we cannot blow insulation. Yes, yeah. Most homes, if we see 1940s or before, we're looking for knob and tube. Because um, they, uh, Romex came out, you know, in the well, late 40s, early 50s. And then, the, but the knob and tube, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of live knob and tube. And um, yeah, as far as a health risk or a fire danger risk, um, just, a, just so many risks, we just don't blow over it. We don't even attempt to. And while blowing insulation, we'll also try to blow around junction boxes. Um, and then we can turn off the insulation. We can just leave the air on and kind of blow, blow around and make sure there's not insulation on those junction boxes throughout the attic or can lights, things like that. So uh, we have a little tester so we can test the knob and tube, see if it's live. Um, sometimes they'll rewire a home and just leave the knob and tube and then and run Romex, but um, anyway. So after the assessor goes through all the health and safety checks, builds a work order, looks at the installation, has an idea of what the home needs, um, we come back to the office, we enter that information into a database called Vision, and it kind of it gives us an idea um, of a savings investment ratio based on what we propose to do as far as cost, and then how much uh, that work will save uh, money as far as uh, deemed savings and give us a guideline to go from there. So, so then uh, we'll call the customer, find a, find a date to, for our crew to come out. Our crew, uh, we have two trucks, an insulation truck, and then just a general high top van that has all our materials. Uh, typically uh, it's three, three crew members and now the process for the assessments usually 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the size of the home. Uh, the process for the actual install by the crews um, is between two to three hours. I mean, it could be as small as an hour if the home just needs insulation, but um, usually the crews will be able to give the customer, hey, we're gonna be here for the next you know, couple hours or Three, if it's a large home with a lot of insulation that we need to blow. But the first thing that we do, the crews will come in, <clears throat> excuse me, and we'll set up a blower door. And what a blower door does, it gives us a uh, reading for as leakage of the home. So we'll set up, uh, you can see the picture on the right, um, that's a blower door, it seals off that door, it's got a fan. That fan is sucking air out of the house, so it's depressurizing the house. Um, it's got a manometer, what he's pushing on, which helps adjust the fan, higher or lower, 
to try to get it to a certain level, 50 pascals, but it gets it to a certain level, and then we get a reading, and it's called CFMs, uh, cubic feet per minute. And at cubic, uh, at this depressurization rate, how many cubic feet are we removing from the home per minute? So that gives us a baseline reading. Of course, we close the windows um, and the doors, and like I said, it gives us a reading before we seal anything on the home. And also, while it's sucking air out of the home, um, it's pulling air from the outside into the home, we're able to go around and look for various areas to where there is air leakage that we may not see otherwise, or we may see a spot but didn't realize you know, how much air is coming through that area. So yeah, it's a really good tool. Um, we used to use like little smoke sticks even to where we'd pressurize, do the reverse, pressurize the home and just, it would just suck air out through the windows and stuff. So it's pretty, pretty neat. But um, and then after we do the blower door test, of course we take it down and we start our process of trying to see all these air leaks. Now I'll just kind of run down, I pulled a page from our, um, from our paperwork. I'll just kind of run down the list of things that we do. <clears throat> um, sheet rock repair, we will, there are small areas, uh, especially like behind washer and dryers, you know, plumbers hate drywall. I mean, they love tearing it out, but they hate putting it back. And um, so we'll patch uh, drywall areas, dry, uh, holes in the drywall, especially on the exterior walls. Um, well, so whenever we're looking at doors, once again, we will take out the old um, weather stripping put in new weather stripping. Like I said, we have various options uh, for different types of doors. Um, put on door sweeps, which are on the bottom of the door, try to help seal it to the threshold. Um, if, the, if the home has window units, it's where you have those little fans that kind of they come with the units that they pull together. They're real thin little accordion-like um, fans. Um, we actually go through and we put in our board uh, it's like a thick foam board and we'll cut to size, put on each side, caulk around and it just uh, helps that heat from coming through and also seals off the air. And that's a big source of air loss on homes with window units. Um, of course, like I said, went over the doors. The doors are a big one. Um, the doors are always a big source of air loss, especially front doors. Um, garage doors, you know, the, the, the door leading out to the garage because they're just constantly used. Um, we will, um, of course, we'll caulk around the door jams. We will uh, try to caulk around ceiling um, light fixtures. Um, you know, anywhere, anywhere there's little seams where air can escape through on the ceiling and, and on the walls. We'll even caulk around the thresholds uh, front and back. And that's not only to keep air from coming through underneath the thresholds, but also water to come in. On windows, we'll caulk the windows um, if needed and uh, give it a you know, fresh um, film of caulking. And then we um, also caulk the outside of the windows, once again, to help that moisture from the good old formal weather and rain from pounding um, on the window and breaking those seals to get in the house. Um, and then underneath the sinks, uh, we will go in and find those plumbing pe penetrations. Most of the time we use a not, uh, an expanding foam. We just kind of shoot it in there. It'll kind of bubble out. And then once it dries, kind of shave it down to where it's nice. But, uh, and sometimes there's just not enough to foam. You know, we may caulk around it, but, um, doesn't sound like much, but whenever you've got just a little, just a little bit of seam around these pipes, but you add all these pipes up together, all the bathrooms, sinks, you name it, um, you know, can end up to a whole, you know, fairly sizable. Attic fan covers. <coughs> um, attic fan covers are a huge source of uh, air loss. Um, uh, and we see quite a few in the Tulsa area. Uh, we build them. Um, on site, we have measurements, but we build them on site. That's just so they don't get damaged during transportation. We use a really rigid 
um, material. It's not drywall, um, but it's super rigid and um, has a nice, you know, nice finish on one side. And then we will, we have this molding that we can cut out and trim it out, make it look nice. Uh, we put like a rubber adhesive type P seal, we call it, around the edge. And then, um, and then, you know, put it up over the, over the attic fan cover. And then we put in these screws to hold it, uh, but the retappable screws almost, most think of it like of a, a drywall anchor to where it's something that you could remove and then reinsert. Um, you know, we, but we do ask the customer, some customers just don't want us to cover it. They said they use it all the time, except for just a few months out of the year. Some customers say they rarely use it and say seal it up. Um, you know, some are kind of in the middle, but um, attic band covers are really, um, we get a lot of air droppage, if you will, from from attic fan covers. And like I said, we've we've evolved. We've you know come a long ways in our attic fan covers. But this is a method that we came up with, as far as not only doing the job, but something that's um, aesthetically pleasing as well. There's all kinds of products you can just velcro up there, and you know looks looks pretty rough. But um, so we do a lot of uh, attic fan covers for sure. Uh, another big uh, thing that we do, of course, is duct sealing. Um, it's, it's similar to blower doors for the home, but it's on the duct system. <clears throat> so in this case, um, a blower door is, uh, once again, it's got a fan that can pressurize or depressurize the duct system. And we use it in conjunction with the blower door and we get a reading on the duct system and it's leakage to the outside which means we're looking for how much air in that duct system is leaking to the outside of the home. Um, we're less concerned about if it's leaking to the inside because that's where it's supposed to go. Um, so we do, once again, we do a duct blaster test and we get a pre-reading and uh, kind of give us a baseline of uh, once we finish all our work, we'll do another reading to see how much we dropped it. Um, then when we get to work on the ducts, um, we, there's, you know, a lot of opportunities, uh, on the duct systems. Uh, the gentleman here, uh, on these old metal, old metal ducts, you'll see, I mean, they're just pieced together. Um, sometimes they have, uh, you know, some old tape around them, but we use a material called mastic. It's almost like a little bit, uh, not as viscous as putty. I mean, it's a little more loose, but basically it's just like a paint, a real thick paint, and we can paint around those seams and then it dries really hard to seal those up. So we're going through all the duct joints um, as those ducts make their run. And then whenever they get to the ceiling, they always like have an elbow that goes down. So we're trying to seal that elbow. And then while we're in the house, we'll take the registers down and seal from the inside as well, and also to where where the duct system, where the ducts uh, meet the drywall in that area, and then put the registers back up. Um, on duct systems, but where we see a lot of issues on duct systems, as far as leakage, are the return boxes. Um, so you got to figure you've got a house, say it's got twelve supplies, which means that's where the air is coming out, uh, whether through the ceiling or the floor. There's usually two at the most, you know, maybe three, but uh, one or two return boxes that's taking all that air in to heat or cool it. So it's getting up, you know, they're typically bigger in size too. So, but you're getting all the moisture into that box and a, a lot at a lot higher volume. So uh, we'll take that register off, you know, the screen, I call them registers, the screen off and We'll try to, uh, re if we need to kind of rebuild it from the inside using foam board, foam, um, all kinds of different techniques depending on, depending on the return box. But we get, uh, it's usually the main source of uh, sealing. Uh, the supply registers, we kind of already went over and, um, and the duct joints as well. Um, 
Another big area is the plenums. The plenums is where all your ducts come in and they connect to your HVAC system. And uh, so you have two plenums, one on each side, one where the air comes in, one where the air goes out. And uh, there's usually a higher pressure of air at those areas. So we find disconnected ducts, it's gonna be coming off those plenums. Um, or if an electrician's up there and they kick a duct, it's usually gonna pull on it. Uh, so we find a lot of disconnected ducts or partially disconnected. You may not even be able to tell if you look at it, but if you pull the insulation back from it, you can just see it's, you know, sticking out. So um, once again, we mask those two. <clears throat> and then finally, um, on the water heaters, uh, we, uh, roof spaces available, we'll install pipe insulation and pipe insulation you know, are typically copper um, pipes. You have an inlet that lets the cold water in, hot water out. And the reason we insulate both sides uh, is because that heat's gonna bind that copper and uh, copper is very um, uh, transductive. So we'll uh, put insulation around those, uh, around those inlet and outlet pipes to, um, you know, to try to help minimize that air loss heat rise. So when it rises to the top of the water heater, it's going to find those copper pipes. And uh, so we try to reduce that as much as possible. And also jackets, like water heater jackets are um, just kind of a wrap that we wrap around. And um, once again, it's almost like a koozie, a koozie for water heaters. We're just trying to keep that heat in. And so the water heater has to recycle less and also will heat up quicker and cut off. So um, I think that's about all I have. Um, like I said, uh, our crews, we kind of have a system. Our crews have a system of, some people explain it's almost like a pit crew. They all kind of know they're, um, they've done so many homes, you know, over the years and, um, you know, probably have a pretty efficient system. Um, try to you know get what we need done, and uh, but not be there all day. Because um, especially whenever we're doing these tests, these uh, when we're doing the blower door tests and the and the duct blast test, we have to cut off the units, and we can't have the units running. So a day like today, the home's going to warm up pretty fast. So we try not to put the customer through that. You know, as long as possible and uh, try to get our work done efficiently. And uh, especially on the inside, we usually blow insulation last because that way we get the work done on the inside, they can turn on their unit. A few things I kind of thought, of, I'm just now remembering on the insulation when we're in the attics, we also build attic dams. Um, so if you do have a mechanical closet with an open top, build a dam around it. So the insulation, well, not only while we're blowing, um, but also you get a good, if an attic has good ventilation, you know, it'll, um, not a lot of dust from fiberglass, but, um, it just help, keeps help anything that might kind of blow into that attic, into the, into the closet and stuff and around the attic accesses too. So, um, so when everything's done, we do another blower door test and duct blaster tests and we obtain our our final reading. And then we kind of know how much we dropped the house, what it started and then how much we reduced it. And so we can see change and document it and uh, get calculated deemed savings. So that's all I've got. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free. Thank you, Bradley. We don't have any questions in the chat right now, okay. uh, but if anyone, would like to put their questions in there. Happy to have them answered. Let's see the other's chat. If you're interested in uh, seeing if you qualify for PSO's home weatherization assistance program, I have included a link on this page of the slide. It takes you to our website, powerforwardwithpso.com. And this link takes you directly to the weatherization page. 
at the bottom of this page, there's a short little form, it, you know, for you to input your contact information. Once that information is input and submitted, it goes directly to Titan and one of the representatives will give you a call to kind of start the process. If you don't have access to the internet or if your renters don't have access to the internet, they can also call the toll-free number listed on this screen as well. When they call that toll-free number, it is kind of what I would call a phone tree. So it'll say, you know, thank you for calling PSO. You'll want to hit one for your home when you call that number and hit three for weatherization. Once you select a three at the second prompt, that call will also be directed to Titan and they'll be able to start the process that way as well. With this program, as Brad has explained, we, we do a lot of measures, what I would consider, you know, non-mechanical measures. We spend on average about $1,600 per home, $1,600 to $1,700 per home. So it is of great value to um, our customers as well as, as the landlords. Uh, if they're interested in having their tenants apply for this program. If this program, is, you know, doesn't suit your needs, or you have other mechanical issues you need to address um, at the home, this link uh, will direct you to all of PSO's uh, energy efficiency and demand response uh, offerings. And those offerings are for both residential and commercial properties. So. If you have a business that you run as well, there's all sorts of business rebate opportunities uh, to be found at our website. So either place has a lot of information on what PSO can offer you in energy efficiency. And then finally, if you have, um, thank you for your time. And if you have any additional questions or con comments, concerns, <laughs> anything if you will, uh, here's how to reach Brad or I, either one, and we'll do our best to uh, answer any questions you might have or find out somebody who can answer the questions for you. Thank you, Mary. We did get one question. Could you clarify okay. if this applies to single family units, multifamily, the type of properties that can be used for weatherization? Yes, this is just single family homes. Um, we, the largest we would do um, is like a duplex. And typically when we do duplexes, we like for both sides to be able to qualify for the program because of the duplex, they do share. I mean, while they do have usually a firewall in between, it's nice to be able to do the entire property, um, but they qualify individually as far as square footage. That makes sense. <laughs> yes. Um, the one, the one side, you know, per meter, the square footage would be. That's great. Well, if there's no other questions, I wanna thank all of you for registering and joining us today. We have been recording this presentation and the recording will be posted on the City of Tulsa's YouTube page. So if someone you know was unable to join us today, they'll be able to watch the recording later. Thank you. Oh, uh, we did get another question on whether there are any programs for multifamily units. Last week, we had a webinar on PSO energy efficiency programs for multifamily properties, and you can view that recording as well as a similar webinar on energy efficiency programs for single family units on the City of Tulsa's YouTube page, where we will be posting this recording as well. And if you have other questions, please feel free to reach out to Mary or Brad. You can also email me uh, Kristen Maughan at the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity at K-M-A-U-N at cityoftulsa.org. Thank you, everyone, and have a good morning.